Hi, Joe Alton, MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website doomandbloom.net with over a thousand articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. Together with my wife, Amy Alton, an advanced registered nurse practitioner, we're the authors of the award-winning Survival Medicine Handbooks, third edition, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, The Layman's Guide, and the designers of an entire line of medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. If you watched my last video, you might know more about the new coronavirus epidemic than you did before. Are we ready for outbreaks to start popping up here, though? Because of lessons learned from Ebola, we're much better than we were several years ago at dealing with contagious diseases, and certainly better than China is now. Many virologists, however, feel that we're short on isolation beds for large outbreaks. Some of them say 200% less hospital beds than are needed, and some say 400% less intensive care unit beds than are needed. And amazingly, that represents an improvement from where we were just a few years ago. We have an imperfect system set up to catch sick people, at least those with symptoms as they enter the country. People coming from epidemic areas are getting their temperature taken and they fill out a survey about possible symptoms. And that's great, but it appears that people can be contagious before they even get a fever or cough or have any other signs of the disease. So sadly, we're only going to catch some of the infected before they enter our country. So patient zero for the U.S. may still be out there somewhere. There's no testing for the new coronavirus outside of the CDC, at least, at present, so your local family doctor probably is going to have to send you to the hospital. Now, that's a problem if the hospitals are already crowded with sick people. If outbreaks occur here in the U.S., you may have to work yourself to keep your family safe on your own. Although it's unclear how bad this outbreak is going to get outside of China's borders, some simple preventive measures will be worth much more than a pound of cure, well, for which there is no cure at present. That means that you need to use non-pharmaceutical interventions, and this includes some changes in your lifestyle that would have to occur in a community-wide epidemic like social distancing. That means staying away from large crowds, not going to work if you're sick, or if a lot of people at work there are sick, keeping kids home from school, and isolating sick patients in your family from the healthy people. Avoiding close contact with other possibly sick individuals is very important, especially if you don't have personal protection gear. Close contact is especially to be avoided. Now that's defined as being within approximately six feet, two meters, or within, let's say, the same room or care area of a novel coronavirus case for a prolonged period of time, and especially while not wearing recommended personal protection equipment, otherwise known as PPE, gowns, gloves, N95 respirators, and things like eye protection. Close contact can include caring for, living with, visiting, or sharing a healthcare waiting area or room with a coronavirus case. Another definition is having direct contact with infectious secretions of a novel coronavirus case. In other words, being coughed on your shirt, for example, by a victim while not wearing, well, a gown and gloves, well, that's going to be a way that you can consider direct contact. What you need to do is you need to wash your hands frequently, carry hand sanitizer while touching surfaces, and then maybe not touch your own eyes, nose, and mouth. Masks and splash-proof eyewear, well, these help to keep you from getting contaminated, but the chances are you are going to touch a lot of areas at work, school, or home that have been touched by a bunch of other people. This virus appears to be able to live on these surfaces for longer than the average microbe. Work surfaces, by the way, include computers used by more than one person. Other surfaces that could get contaminated could be your shirt, as I mentioned before, your pants, even your shoes, and even more. For masks, you should look for a supply of N95 masks. That's this here. These are better than standard surgical masks, but are not 100% protective. During outbreaks in your community, you always should wear your N95 masks, or better, if you are going to have to be outside of your home. This is not just an option, it's a sign of social responsibility on your part. And it's also, by the way, not just important to have proper masks, but more importantly to know how to put them on correctly, how to achieve a proper fit, how to take them off safely, as I showed in a recent video.
I also have articles on this procedure on the website at doomandbloom.net in our latest book, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease. You'll find the procedure in a section at the back of the book. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't emphasize the importance of eye protection to prevent airborne contamination. When aerosolized droplets loaded with virus hits your eye, the virus makes its way to your tear duct and from there to your nasal passages, sinuses, and oropharynx. You can use either goggles like these or face shields like this to go along with, but never in place of, a good mask. Also, you'll find in our book's website and on this channel, my thoughts on putting together an effective epidemic sick room, something I think is very important. Next video, I'm going to deconstruct one of our pandemic kits and discuss what you might want to have in your medical storage for epidemic preparedness. This is Joe Alden, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. If you're concerned, by the way, about epidemic disease, please check out Nurse Amy's Pandemic Supplies and Kits, just a part of her entire line at her store at store.doomandbloom.net. That's store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.